now we will be listening to another uh, uh, official you know, from uh, our uh, one of our uh, federal uh, uh, agencies, the National Institutes of Health, uh, and we'll be listening next to uh, Dr. Zenia Tigno. Uh, Dr. Tigno is uh, or recently joined uh, the Office of uh, Research on Women's Health as the office's first associate director for careers. Dr. Uh, Tigno received her doctorate in physiology magna cum laude from the University of Würzburg and master's degrees in physiology and epidemiology from the UP College of uh, Medicine. Uh, she taught medical physiology for nearly 30 years before joining NIH in 2009. Prior to joining ORWH, Dr. Tigno managed a multidisciplinary research portfolio at the National Institute of Nursing Research, or NINR, which included grants on women's health and the study of women's health across the nation, first one. Dr. Tigno was also a program director at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, where she oversaw grants related to training and special projects in the airway biology, and disease branch of the Division of Lung Diseases, as well as in the National Center on Sleep Disorders Research. She organized workshops related to data science, barriers and challenges of underrepresented investigators and career transitions of early stage researchers. Just like Dr. Tupas, I would like to say that the opinions expressed are my own and uh, of course with a lot of input from my current office and do not reflect those of the National Institutes of Health. And uh, while Dr. Tupas um, emphasizes STEM fields, I will emphasize the, uh, the other M on STEM. So it's now science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and medicine. So I will be concentrating on the biomedical workforce instead of the um, other STEM areas. So my topic for today is gender and ethnic equity in the biomedical workforce. So, so the question is, why are we studying this, the gender and uh, ethnic diversity? Why is it important? And how is the representation of women currently, as well as ethnic groups and women of intersecting identities in the biomedical workforce? And how has the COVID pandemic impacted um, the academics? the women academics. So what we see here is the academic STEM progression by gender and race. And this was, this is all data from 2015. As you can see, women outnumber men, even with the percentage of bachelor's degrees earned. Also in the master's program and the doctorate degree. So this is what we usually refer to as priming the pump. And yet when you go down to the academic staircase or the academic ladder, you see that their representation starts to dwindle, even though there, is, there appears to be gender parity as, even as far as the doctoral programs are concerned. So what is the issue here? And if you look at the number of graduate students, actually this is more recent, this is from the um, state of Women in Academic Medicine, which was reported in 2019, females outnumber males as far as the doctoral programs are concerned in, uh, in biology and in medicine. But when you look at the postdocs, there are more postdocs who are males than females, which leads us to, to say, why is that so? that the proportion of postdocs do not correspond to the proportion of graduate students. And again, if you were to look at the um, biological and medical workforce, you see that as far as the postdocs are concerned, most of them, 30% are foreign postdoctorate men. And the least number are among the foreign postdoctoral women whereas US postdocs, men and women are almost equal in number. Now, when we go to the medical school, again, you can see here the uh, 
increase in the number of women medical graduates from the 1980s to the most recent one, and they have reached almost parity with the males. And the number of male medical graduates have been constantly decreasing. However, when you look at the percentage of active physicians, so again, as mentioned, there are almost equal number of male and female MDs, but those who are actively practicing, 64% are males and only 35% are women. And if you look at the uh, a percentage of all active physicians by race, race and ethnicity, we see that the great majority is still white, 56.2%, compared to all others. And it's followed, of course, by the, the Asian MDs, 17%. So these are the active physicians in the country, in the US. And if you look at the medical school faculty, so as you mentioned earlier, postdocs males are greater than females and whites are greater than all other racial groups combined. And in the medical school faculty this time, 64% are still white compared to the other racial groups. So when you look at the medical school faculty and this is data as of 2018, Males outnumber females in all racial and ethnic groups, except for the African-Americans where females outnumber males. So here where you see the purple bar, those are women. They are more than the males. And it's only in that ethnic group where you have this difference. Now, when we, say, when we have been looking at those data, we see that number one, we mentioned that, well, maybe there is not that much of a talent pool. But as we see between 1980 and, 90, and 2013, this is the population growth, how, how many fold has it increased? Underrepresented PhDs have been steadily increasing, in fact, very steeply, whereas white or well-represented groups have increased, but not as much. And yet when we look at the faculty, the, the hires, we see that this great disparity exists. It's not proportional to the number who have started, the proportion of a PhDs earned and multiple fold increase does not correspond to how much, how many more have been hired. In the same way, among females, female PhDs have also experienced a very uh, steep rise in the number of uh, recipients. And yet, and look at the male population, they have, not, they have not gone up as much as the females. And yet when the hiring process is there, you can see this very big gap between the number available and the ones who are hired. So if I may go back, that is what we call an intersectionality. So if here is a race, so the well-represented is, all, always represented very well in the hiring process. And if you're female, it's also a definite disadvantage. So again, when we look at the uh, percentage of faculty members, it is only among the instructor level where you have a higher percentage of females being hired in the medical school. So 58% of the instructor population in medical schools are women. But as you go higher in the academic ladder, there are only 46% assistant professors who are women, only 37% associate professors. And finally, at the full professor level, only 25% of the medical faculty consist of females. Again, when we look at the racial patterns here, I'm sorry, uh, full-time women faculty by rank, race, and ethnicity. Again, we see that in all of these levels, the well-represented group, which are the whites, are fully in control, especially in the full professor level. And they have always outnumbered all other racial groups combined. 
So when we talk of intersectionality, we usually speak of that double bind of race and, and uh, sex. So being female and being non-white or a woman of color puts you in that double bind where you are definitely at a disadvantage of advancing in your academic career. And again, these are the numbers from the uh, American Association of Medical Colleges. Medical school applicants, women outnumber men, 51%. As graduates, they have diminished a bit as residents. And further down the line, as faculty, 41% of medical school faculty consist of women, but at the level of the department chair, and the dean, they only comprise 18%. So the takeaway is that women have constituted 58% or more of graduate students in the biological, clinical, and health science doctoral program since 1994. So these, these are the programs of interest to NIH. But in 2018, they only comprise 40% of full-time basic science, clinical science, and other health science MD, PhD, or PhD faculty at medical schools. And women make up the majority of the faculty only at the instructor level, although they outnumber men as far as doctoral degrees are concerned. And in 2018, only 13% of full-time women faculty come from an underrepresented in medicine, race, or ethnic group. The highest, of course, was among the assistant professors, so the first uh, faculty rank in the academic ladder. So why is this so? So there are so several propositions. One is that women usually take the greater uh, proportion of caregiving in the house as well as domestic um, responsibilities. Second, we have this dual career spousal relationships where both of them are in, in careers and it's usually the woman who has to give in to the career of the males. Third is the grant, grant funding that they receive. And the most recent NASM report, the, which was published in March, I believe of this year, identifies also as has been in the past, sexual harassment, bias and discrimination during recruitment, retention and promotion, and probably also pay inequity as reasons why women leave the scientific careers. So take, for instance, the birth of the first child. Now, this is especially true for women in their early careers as scientists. That coincides as well with their prime reproductive years. So that is the time when they're getting married, uh, having their first babies, etc. And after the first child, as you can see here, there is a steep decline of women in the STEM jobs that we see. So from 100%, they have got, gone down to about 60%. So like 42% of new, mother, new mothers leave a full-time STEM job, whereas only 15% of fathers do. Now in, in relationships where both of the spouses are working, they have different partnering patterns is what it's called. So like men, 34% of them have academic partners, 20% have stay home partners, meaning they don't work. And these others are, uh, have employment, but non-academic, 10% are single. 34% of women have employed part of women in, um, in, with, in dual careers, many women have academic partners who are, have partners who are also in the academe, 21% are males, 5% have stay home partners and 34% are, uh, have employed non-academic partners. What this means is that Men have the advantage because they have a greater proportion of stay home spouses versus women. So when there are uh, issues, for instance, about the child going to school, et cetera, and taking, up, taking on domestic responsibilities, 
or bringing children to the hospital and caregiving, it is usually the women who take over these functions because only 5% of them have stay home partners, whereas for the males, they have a greater proportion of stay home partners. Now, the other thing that we mentioned was funding. So in addition to the, to the fact that they are caregivers and that in the spousal relationship, they are usually at a disadvantage. Even with NIH funding, as you see, RPGs are our research pro, uh, project grants. So these are the, your typical R01s, BO1s, U grants, et cetera. So they're not the training grants. 66% of these grants go to men and only 33, 30 to 33% go to women. So, and as we know, funding in an academic environment, especially in an academic medical environment is very critical because without funding, you may not even be renewed as a faculty member. You have to more or less uh, provide your own um, salary through grant funds from the NIH. And very little is provided by the university that you that employs you. So you're more or less expected to bring your own dough with you and without. This is true of uh, graduate schools and academic medical schools in contrast to say the social sciences where you're not, a, you're not expected to bring in your own salary. In medical schools and in graduate schools related to medicine, grant funding is critical, especially in the early periods of your career or the first decade of your career where you're more or less expected to provide uh, at least 50% or more of your salary. Now we have the so-called career development grants or K grants. And we usually look at the transition from these career development grants funded by NIH to what we call the uh, RPG grants or the R01 equivalent grants. And among those who apply male and female, we see again that the funding rate for men is much better than those for women. So again, this in a way is why a lot of women decide to leave the academic workforce. Apart from that, we have said that in the latest NASM report, which is the promising practices for addressing underrepresentation of women in science, engineering, medicine, opening doors, bias, discrimination, and harassment remain as very major factors and major drivers of underrepresentation in medicine. And women in medicine or in, in academia are said to experience, 50% of them are said to experience some form of sexual harassment. And the proportion is even greater among those who are marginalized, such as women of color, women with disabilities, and LGBTQIA uh, women. Now came the pandemic that we know as COVID-19. How has this affected women in, in the academia, particularly those in the my medical workforce? We know for instance, that many women that the health workforce, uh, such as the nurses predominantly, and many of the physicians are actually women. So they are not only caregivers at home, they are also the healthcare workforce. And of course, that leaves very little time left for doing the research. So number one effect is uh, women having less time for doing research because they have to be the caregivers at home. They have to be the homeschoolers or the teachers at home. They have to provide everything. And then sometimes if they are clinician scientists, they also have to to deliver uh, health healthcare as part of their employment. So they are put at a very big disadvantage. And the other thing as, is, as we see, because in the domestic environment, most male uh, academicians, although they may have some women in, um, in academia as partners, many of them have stay at home partners and that gives them even more time to do their research. So again, they are outnumbering women in that respect, as can be seen from the number of preprint 
and publication rates showing that uh, although women have always been underrepresented as far as um, publications are concerned, it seems that because of this COVID from the 20% of working papers, they have gone down to 12% of authorship of anything related to COVID literature. And although for instance, epidemiology and medicine um, are not really male dominated fields, but when it comes to articles being coded or doing presentations for the public, it's usually men who are called to task to, you know, for their comments, et cetera. And what's more, women of color or leaders in that community who are already disenfranchised to begin with are very poorly represented. Although these communities are the ones which are, who are heavily impacted by the COVID situation. So authorship grants um, given to them, um, the, the fact that they have less time to do their research. Many of them, by the way, have lost also funding because in the interim that they cannot go back to the lab, they are not able to, to do the research and submit applications. So women academics take up the increased responsibility of childcare, failing well behind their male peers. So what we see is that the COVID pandemic has only served to magnify the already existing gender and racial ethnic inequities in the biomedical workforce. That has always existed in the past. It's very evident now with the COVID epidemic and even far beyond when this uh, pandemic is over, we will still see that impact. Because in the meantime, while the whole world has been progressing, they have had to stay at home. There is no childcare available outside the home. So if their children cannot go to school, they have to homeschool them. And if, they, if they're at home, then their domestic responsibilities take over much of their time. So that is the current situation for us. Thank you. I'm sorry I have no data at all on Filipino academics and that is certainly something of interest that we would like to pursue in the future. Okay. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Dr. Uh, Tigno.